Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast, The Joyful Frugalista, and now here's your host, Serena Bird. Hello, I'm super excited to share the good news that I have written another book, How to Pay Your Mortgage Off in 10 Years, responds to the cost of living crisis that many people find themselves in. Whether you are paying off a mortgage, you've paid off a mortgage, you aspire to buy a house and have a mortgage, or you know someone who does have a mortgage, this book will have lots of frugal tips and tricks as well as some finance hacks for you. Thank you so much. You my frugalisters and welcome. I have a special guest on this podcast today and of course all of my guests are special. So who wants to be a millionaire? Today we're going to talk about how to build a million dollar portfolio. But first, I have a favour to ask of you. If you enjoy this podcast and find it useful for you, please pay it forward by sharing with a friend. And even better, please follow this podcast, The Joyful Frig Lister. Today's guest is financial advisor Ben Nash. He is founder of Pivot Wealth and has been listed as part of Australia's most influential financial advisors for seven consecutive years. And he's awarded by the Independent Financial Advisor as Australia's best client servicing financial advisor. He is author of Replace Your Salary by Investing, Unstuck, and then his latest book, which we are going to delve into in this podcast, which is Virgin Millionaire, the step-by-step guide to your first million and beyond. So welcome, Ben. Thanks for having me. Good to be here, Serena. Good to chat with you. I see a lot of your content, particularly on LinkedIn. I know you are very active. You've got a lot of great tips and you've got a really good way of encouraging people to get saving and investing. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. Well, look, ultimately, when it comes to money, uh, I think there's a lot of great ideas floating around, but uh, great ideas on their own, not going to get you wealthy. You, you need to take action. So that's one of the concepts that I talk about through Virgin Millionaire. It's like you give you enough to take the next step get started and you build your momentum from there. This is a really important thing because I think like when it comes to wealth, there's a lot of people who are really into manifesting and doing the mental work. And that's actually really important. But like Mm -hmm. you wouldn't do that if you had fitness goals. You take yourself down to the gym or you go on a diet. But with money, sometimes people tend to think, oh, if I just think positive thoughts, the money's Mm -hmm. just going to come. Well, look, I think you need to have a goal. Like goals are, are great, things that you want to work towards, and it can be things that you you reinforce through, you know, affirmations or whatever sort of cup of tea you fancy. But at the end of the day, you, to have a goal, you also need to have a plan. And then I think even further to that, you want to have a system. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big sort of process sort of guy, you know, systemizing your savings, systemizing your investing, systemizing your debt reduction and systemizing your planning, you know, how you educate yourself about money, how you stay on top of things, very powerful. And I think, you know, money is one of these things that I think because everyone or, you know, pretty much everyone gets paid money every week or month or, or whatever, we think that money should be easy, but money is complicated. Like there's so much to it. There's so many different things to know. There's so many different areas and investing options and just when you think you you know a lot, you realize that there was this whole other thing for you to to get across. And I think that can be really overwhelming and it puts people off because particularly for people that are early on in the journey, they think that they need to know all of that stuff, but you don't need to know all of that stuff. All you need to know is you need to know enough to take the next step and ideally enough to be thinking a couple of steps ahead to make sure that you're not you know doing anything that is going to cause any issues down the track. But once you take your next step, in taking that step, you learn some things and then you build your knowledge a bit further. That makes your next step a little bit clearer and it makes it easier for you to take it as well. And so we do a lot of work with uh, professional athletes and I've spent a lot of time through that work trying to think about like some comparisons or how do I draw them into money? Because th- for those people as well, they uh, can find money very overwhelming. And I think there's a lot of crossover between being elite in the sports field and being elite with your money. Like a lot of people look at professional athletes and they make it look so easy. Like it just seems effortless for them. <laughs> it, 
It's it's like Olympics where everyone's like a couch expert on the on gymnastics and stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But they just like it looks like it's just a walk in in the park for them. But what you don't see is you don't see the years and often decades of practice. And no one starts out at that elite level. If you start, you know, when you're younger, you start with the real lack of skills and you do one thing and then you build one skill and then you build another skill and then you keep going. And money's exactly the same. If you take that approach, you can end up elite with your money, like, you know, a, a lead on the sporting field. That's a great analogy. And it's one I really like because quite surprising to us, my 12 year old has developed an interest in sport and trained six to seven days a week and is doing <laughs> up to 15, 16 hours a week. And certainly oh. we've noticed the improvement in the last 18 months. And just to be clear for anyone listening, this has come from him, like not from me. I've actually suggested he reduce and he's not very happy about that. <laughs> so <laughs> it's definitely come from him. But you started at the beginning about talking about the importance of goals. And your book is all about getting to the first million. Is that a big goal for a lot of people? Well, I think that we're really lucky to live in a great country in Australia, but living well in Australia doesn't come cheap. Like we've got average property value is around a million dollars. Average income across the country is a hundred thousand dollars. And so basically if you're if you know everyone's definition of financial freedom is a little bit different, the lifestyle they want to live, how, how they want that to be. But ultimately, for a lot of people, what it boils down to is that you've got a home which without a mortgage, so you've got a home that you, that you actually own, and that you've got enough money coming into your bank account every month or every year that allows you to live the lifestyle that you want. And so if you know, we, we agree that that's sort of a, the, an outcome that a lot of people are working towards for you to own an average home in Australia, debt-free, and to replace the average income, you'd need to have about $3 million today. And so if you're, if we're thinking about 10 years from now, 20 years from now, or 30 years from now with inflation, that's obviously going to be a lot more than that. But $3 million, that's a pretty significant amount of wealth. But yeah. just to be clear, that gives you the average income and an average property, which a, a lot of pe people want to do a little bit better than average. And so that means that by by necessity, you're almost you're going to need to become a multi-millionaire. And so, yeah, look, I, I don't think being a millionaire is what it once was, but I think it's a really good starting point. And I can say for sure that the first million dollars, if you're on that path, the first million dollars is the hardest million that you'll ever build. It will take the longest. Once you get there, you've got money, you know, compounding that working for you. And that makes the future progress a, a whole lot easier. I certainly agree with that. So I hit my first million late 2018, early 2019, I think. From memory, no, sorry, mm. two, uh, late 2017, early 2018, or yeah. at least 2018. And then I got married and combined my wealth with my husband. So it's no longer just me, but we've been able to work as a team for the last seven years and that's made a huge difference. But I agree, like you sort of feel like, Am, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And it's such an amazing feeling when you get to that. And then, yeah, it does get easier. You get in the habit and things compound too. Yeah, look, I, I think a lot of people get put off by the fact that in the early days when it comes to investing or saving or building your wealth, that the progress isn't anything earth shattering. It's it's not like, you know, you, you're putting in $100 a week and then all of a sudden you've got $100,000 there. Like that's going to take some time. And I think that because the early results don't seem like huge to people, then they think that it's probably okay if they just wait and, you know, do a little bit less or don't do anything at all. And I'll just play a little bit of catch up later on. But what people don't realize that it's only by doing the early work, it's only by doing that, that, that initial momentum building that graph, that what, that's what allows you to get the really amazing results right at, at the other end. And so yeah, money, time and money is a wonderful thing when it's working for you, but it also works against you when you're not taking action. And one of the things that I, I talk about in the book, when I first sat down to start writing and I started thinking, well, like, 
these days I feel like all of this knowledge is out there, right? Like, you know, you, there's so many financial educators out there. That the, the information is there that, you know, you should be saving and how to budget and how to set up your banking and index funds are good and other investments are making money and all of these things that that's all in, you know, people sort of get that. But so if everybody knows what to do, well, then why aren't we all rich already? You, you know, and <laughs> Like if it was that, if it was about knowing, then it would all be, we'd all have more money than we have now. So what I came to was that actually the the real key to success is more in what holds people back than what you need to do to go forward. And a lot of times it's a, it's a lack of action, which is like not enough, not to say that you're not doing anything, but you're not doing enough. And often that comes from a lack of motivation. And again, it's not that people aren't motivated because everyone I talk to about their money is they're generally pretty motivated. Some of them are highly motivated, you would say, but sometimes, and in a lot of cases, not quite motivated enough to do what really needs to be done to get the real results that they're after. Mm, well, that's it. It's a commitment, isn't it? You have to make that commitment to your future self or actually your current self as well. Well, commitment is part of it, but it's also about being clear on what you need to do because people think, and particularly if you've got a good income and you're saving at a good rate, you, you, you probably think you're doing pretty well, like most people do, but they don't realize that if you've got some, some, some big lifestyle goals that you want to get to, that you want to be you know, financially free at, at, at an age way before the retirement age, or you want to have a lifestyle that sort of like way above average, the ability to travel and you know, do what you want and look after your family and all of these sorts of things that you probably have some really big targets that you need to get to. And that's going to take a lot of work to get there. And so you need to be clear on the numbers. And it amazes me how few people actually are like, what is your trajectory? If you keep doing exactly what you're doing now, where are you going to be in a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years? And are you happy with that? Because if you're not, you need to change something. And if you're not, and you don't change something, and you don't know that you need to change something, so you don't, then time goes on. And all that means is that you need to do more and sacrifice more to end up in the same position, or you sacrifice and settle on your goals that you have to settle for less in the future, because the longer you leave it, the it gets really hard. So that's why it's so important to, to be clear on where you need to get to, where what you're doing now is going to get you to, and then looking, you know, does something need to change? And then at least you can make a conscious decision about changing it. Yeah, making a conscious decision and and knowing where you're heading. So how different is your approach to say the FIRE, financial independence, retire early movement? As you know, there's a huge focus Mm. now on younger people working and saving, sometimes living on or saving up to 70% of their income so that their future selves can retire early and not yeah, necessarily look, do, a, I, a, a, a do much. <laughs> a lot of respect uh, for, for people in that position. I, I think financial freedom is something that I think everyone should be working towards. But I, I'd say that there's a lot of different ways to be right when it comes to your money. And I think ultimately that it's important for every single person that they find an approach that works for them. And so if that sort of setup is is something that connects with you, that you're comfortable with, then, you know, it's worth you seriously considering. But I would say that the, the approach that I personally follow and that, that I advocate with our clients and the people in our broader community, it's probably two key sort of variations from the traditional FIRE, very similar to to fire a love index funds, a love all of that investing and replacing your salary with investment income. Well, that's my last book was called Replace Your Salary by Investing. It's like, what's the one of the key definitions of financial freedom as I see it? But yeah, there's there's probably two differences. One is that I don't think that personally, I, I don't want to sacrifice my lifestyle today in a drastic way just so that I can be financially free a little bit sooner. I would much rather find what I call lifestyle balance, where to me, I think that financial success is spending as much as you possibly can today, but ensuring that you can then continue that level of spending in the future. And where a lot of people do the opposite of what you just mentioned there, where it's like, you know, they're spending 90, 95, 100, 105% of their incomes and not saving enough. And then, and then in the future, they're going to 
they're expending here and then they're going to have to um, drastically cut back their expenses. And that's not good either. But I also think that the other way is not good. You probably want to try and find the balance. The other um, difference is, and I know that this is sort of coming into a more contemporary version of FIRE, but I believe that property and in particular leverage, or so borrowing money to invest, is a well, the maths tells us that it's a key accelerator. But when you're choosing a good investment and you add borrowing with your borrowed money with your savings, you end up with more investments behind you. And therefore, your investments will grow faster than they would if you just crank it all into a, a share portfolio or an ETF portfolio or whatever the case may be. By the same token, though, like when you use debt, then your cash flow generally gets worse because when you're buying, particularly when you're buying quality blue chip properties, generally the the cash flow of that investment is going to be negative. And so that's probably inconsistent with traditional fire. But I believe that there's stages to money. And um, this is actually the core premise of the Virgin Millionaire book that we found that there's five key stages that people move through. Ultimately, you're trying to get to full financial freedom where you can do whatever you want but you've got to start at the start and set the foundations and then move through these other stages. And the asset building stage is, is sort of consistent through the stages, but there's, you know, there's a stage where you want to be building your wealth. So you, you end up in a wealth position where you've got enough wealth to actually replace your ideal level of salary. And then the investment strategy that you follow to get to that point may be different to the strategy that you follow beyond that point. For a lot of people, it will be. And so that might involve selling down invest- an investment property or investment properties, for example, to then reallocate the money into equities or um, ETF type investments, which would generally going to be better from an income generation perspective as well. And so I, I think, like I said, there's a lot of different ways to be right uh, when it comes to your money, but I, th- I think the important thing there is is finding an approach that fits in with the lifestyle that you want to live, that you are ultimately comfortable with, and one that's going to deliver the results that you're after. I must say I was really interested to see how strong you place property investment at the beginning phase. And so I forget the term you've got, I think the five different terms, but the, the beginning phase of an investment journey. And I think a lot of people now are saying go straight to ETFs or, or, or other classes, but I guess I can speak to my own experience, which was certainly that was a key way that we built our wealth. And is right. it, it was a different time. It was a different phase when property prices were a lot different. But I think as young people, the ability to renovate, to do up and to landscape and to add value certainly mm. really was a key factor in getting us off the ground. Yeah, look, I think that the, the sort of the the thinking behind that or the, the the strategy behind that is that property in Australia has gone up by an average of 6.3% per annum over the last 150 or so years. If you narrow that down to what I would consider blue chip properties, which is like properties in the uh, areas, the metro areas of the this uh, the Australian uh, cities with the strongest population growth forecast moving forward, which is Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, basically, that it seems likely, and it, like I was just looking at all the commentary coming out in the news at the moment, that property market continues to go up. And so if you're going hard on ETF investing, you're going to make a whole bunch of money. You've got compound interest for you, working for you. Like that's a great Dividends. strategy. <laughs> It's, it's a good, yeah, you build your investment income. There's very little cash flow risk because if RBA put the interest rates up to a million percent, doesn't really matter. Well, probably matters for the performance of your shares, but there's no cash flow commitment. It's not like you're actually making debt repayments. But if you do all of that and then property is still doubling in the background every every 10 or so years, which is pretty much what happens in Australia, Assuming that you will buy a property at some point, you're just going to end up paying a heap more for this for the same property. Now, I get that property investing is not as flexible, and it absolutely comes with with risk, and that risk is really crucial to manage. And I I, I sort of shout that pretty loudly in the book when I talk about uh, property investing. But I think that if if you can do those things, you manage your risk, you choose good property, and the cash flow works for you and your situation generally that's going to result in more progress than you get even with the world's best ETF portfolio. 
Interesting. Thank you. And um, yeah, it's been a phenomenal ride in the last couple of years with property. So uh, I didn't realise that the average 150 year returns was so high at 6.3%. But yeah, it's been wild the last couple of years. Yeah, well, the the ratio of average property value to average income has increased from two to three times in the 80s to, well, in Sydney, we've got average income of 100,000, average property value 1.3 million. So it's like 13 times now. And so that has seen people that were in the property market, they've benefited from that. And that's why, you know, uh, the baby boomer generation is like the wealthiest generation in the country. But I, I sort of shudder to think that if that happens again, if we go from 13 times to 25 times, even, you know, if you're if you're not in the property market, you're going to have some serious catching up to do. Yeah, definitely. So what is the 5% rule? You talk about this in your book, and I know you're not fire, but in the fire movement, it's quite popular to talk about the 4% rule, particularly Mr. Money, Mas- Bustach and others. Talking about you yes. know the, the simple kind of math being four percent, but do you have a five percent rule? So what is it? Yeah, look, uh, maybe I'm just a fan of brown numbers, but the <laughs> the five percent rule is basically about the investment income that you can draw from a from a pool of investments without eating into capital. So the long term return on the share market uh, in Australia it's nine point eight percent. It's a little bit higher uh, on the US share market. And so basically, if you've got a return that's pretty much sort of 10%, you take off a a bit of an allowance for the fees on your investment product itself up to 1%. That sort of leaves you with about 9%. You take off up to 3% for inflation. That gets you to sort of 6%. And so 5% is a slightly conservative estimate of how much income you should be able to draw from that portfolio while preserving your capital, but also while preserving your income in inflation adjusted terms. Because if you had, say, a million dollars invested today, that should give you an income of around 50,000, well, a total return of about $100,000 in the next 12 months. If you draw an income of 50,000, so you're drawing out half, you're keeping the other 50,000 to be reinvested. So in 12 months time, you're going to have about a million and $50,000. Then in the following year, it's going to generate you like 105,000. That's how you get your like inflation protected return, essentially. And so, look, it's, it is a rough rule of thumb. Uh, I think that when we have clients that are getting close to the point where they're looking to start really turning off their income tap and then living on their investments, then I think it's worth getting a lot more granular in terms of, is it structured the right way? What investment income should we expect? What are your living expenses? And we make sure that we marry those up. But if you've got like quite a while to get to the point where you're financially free, generally a pretty simple and easy number to wrap your head around in terms of setting you some goals or targets. So I think that the like compound interest calculator or a goal saving calculator is a powerful tool, very powerful that any everyone should be able to use to allow them to set some targets around their money and around their, their investing. And it's amazing how much, you know, talking, I was talking earlier about motivation and how you build up your motivation around this stuff. That can be a, a, a big part of that in terms of understanding the 5% rule, your trajectory and the, uh, the path that you're on. Yeah, I must say I'm a little bit addicted to compound interest calculators. I mean, I used to be <laughs> addicted to the um, mortgage reduction calculators and I used a lot of oh, them yeah. in my um, yeah. most recent book, How to Pay Off Your Mortgage in 10 Years. But now that I'm also investing more in ETFs and other shares, I'm more addicted to the compound interest calculators. They're fascinating. What's your go-to compound interest calculator? Am I allowed to ask? Uh, yeah, I like the government ones. What is it? The the money, money smart. the money smart ones. Yeah, just because yeah. they're easy. Although they've redone the website, and I don't find them as easy to find. <laughs> yes, just on. I have to find them on Google, but I do. Uh, yeah, I think that they're they're my go-to as well. And plus, because it's the government, you know that they're not going to you know send some advertising cookie to track you around the internet afterwards. Yeah, exactly, and offer you financial products. <laughs> That does happen. I want to talk about what for many people is a dirty word. It starts with B and that is budget. Yes. So how important is a budget? And I'm just going to start here by saying I do have a budget, but I don't follow it religiously. And 
A couple of years ago, someone actually in the fire community posted a little bit about this. And interestingly, a lot of naturally frugal people like myself don't necessarily have budgets in the conventional sense. And you have Mm. views too about high income earners and whether they need budgets or not. Yeah, look, I think that I'm not a big fan of the B word either, but uh, I think a good savings plan is important for everyone to have. But equally as important is your saving system. And there are some key outcomes that you want to be getting from a savings plan and system. You want your money to be easy to manage. You want it to be clear how, whether your, whether your budget or your savings plan is working on a, at any point in time, basically. And you, you want to sort of give yourself a feedback loop on how well your plan is working with your money. Obviously, a little bit biased as a financial planner, I believe everyone should have a plan. And if you don't have a feedback loop on whether your plan is working, it's, well, it's pointless doing the plan in the first place. And so that's why I am a big fan of the buckets approach to banking. I run it for myself and my wife and our family. And with all of our clients as well, where we have different bank accounts for different buckets of money. And then, you know, you get the right money in the right places at the right times. And what I get is bills automated without me having to think about that. I get it clear. My pocket money comes into my bank account every single week, sits there in debit for me to spend. I know exactly where, you know, how much I've got to spend at any point in time. My travel money is building up debt payments getting made and then savings building up to drive some motivation so I can see that sort of happening. And then when you know pay increases or income increases over time, that that increase is actually captured, unless I do anything, it's captured as opposed to just evaporating, basically. And so I think that you know, the the feedback loop that you get from a system like that is very powerful because at any point in time, I know if anything's working and I don't have to, I don't track my expenses. I don't really worry about anything other than how much money do I have in my pocket money account, keep a, an odd check on the travel account to see when I can book my next holiday. And then I look at my savings balance probably seven times a day to you know <laughs> watch it in, increase, increasing basically. <laughs> But if you can get all of that with one bank account, then I think all power to you. But at the end of the day, that's probably a very, very small portion of the of the population. For most people, having a bit of structure really helps with that. And I think that if you are working with a financial planner, for having a system that's going to give them a feedback loop on how well everything's working as well, also then allows them to be able to support you better and make help you make better decisions and help you take better actions. And that has some serious upside. So even if you could do it in one account, you, you know, it may be worth thinking about those sorts of benefits that you can get from having a good system. I think that for it doesn't matter if you've got a low income, an average income or a high income, it's critically important, I think, at all of those levels. I think for lower income people, I think that sometimes they think that they don't have enough to warrant having a budget. And I think that's a major mistake. And we see a lot of financial stress in that position, which is understandable, you know, when you're struggling to make ends meet. But at the end of the day, like everyone's only got so much money to work with. So you're better off to have a plan for how you're going to spend that money. Even if you're not 100% happy with the plan, you know, at least right now, at least you've got you've got a plan and you know what's going on. Average income, just as important, make sure that you're making progress. And on the higher income side, people think sometimes because they've got they've got a really high income that it's not that important. But the more money you earn, the easier it is for lifestyle creep to kick in. And then you're not saving as much and you're not making the progress that you want. And so the cost of not having a good system can be quite extreme. Yeah, definitely. I hear you regarding that lifestyle creep. I'm always amazed with some of the people I meet, particularly at work who seem to be doing really well and once you actually delve down and have conversations you're like really like yeah anyway different people are at different stages on their their journey that's right but finally do you have a frugalista tip to share yeah so look i i did uh, scratch my head and, and give this one some thought and my biggest tip is probably if you're having kids if you could try to have children of the same sex and have them close together, 
<laughs> and that will allow you to basically recycle all of your clothing for the kids as well as all of the equipment as well. And if you, we, my wife and I, we've got two girls and they're 17 months apart. And it's worked out pretty neatly that like one gets out of the cot and then the next one gets the cot and one's got the pram and then the next one's got it. All of those things, I, those numbers really do add up when it comes to that stuff. So appreciate that that's uh, sometimes it's not 100% in your control, but no. if you can sort of divine <laughs> that outcome, uh, there's some savings up for grabs. I do have two boys and I must say I had always wanted a girl and we laugh a little bit with my sons and I'm definitely not giving them back, by the way. I love them both dearly. <laughs> but my youngest was born when I was on posting and lived in Taiwan and at that stage everyone desperately wanted boys, um, particularly too because yeah. it was a dragon year, a golden dragon year, and it was very auspicious. There were lots of people okay. trying hard for boys and I had a boy and I was a bit like, oh, that's okay. I kind of wanted a girl. But that said... I have noticed it is very cost effective when you can pass on clothes from one to the other. Hundred <laughs> percent, yeah, it all it adds up for sure, and you know, good for the planet as well. Reduce our waste, reduce our footprint. All positive. All positive, most definitely. So, thank you so much for being my guest today. So, now, where can people find you? I'm assuming your book is in all good bookstores, and so that's Virgin Millionaire: The Step by Step Guide to Your First Million and Beyond. Yeah, so it's on uh, in all of the bookstores, Amazon and, and the online places. You can also check out, uh, there's a page on our website, pivotwealth.com.au and then forward slash books to look at the Virgin Millionaire book and the other books. We've also got a bunch of free content and resources that people can use. And I also have a podcast, the Mo Money podcast, which you can check out on all of the podcast platforms. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Great to be with you, Serena. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to The Joyful Frugalista with Serena Bird. And of course, sound has been by Neil Hadley. You could talk, and I would listen, I would understand your mind. Oh, I love to be with you, walking toward the sea. The times when I'm lonely, you could be the one to comfort me every day. I am thankful that I said. to you.